Hi Dan, how you doing? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks mate. Are you all set for Kevin Casey? Yeah, sure, ready when you are. Alright, great, let me patch you. Thank you very much. Alright Kevin, you are now on with Harry Davies from MMA Latest News. Go ahead Harry. Hi Kevin, thanks for joining me on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. How's it going, Harry? I'm doing good, thanks. Have you uh, got a long head of, long day ahead of media obligations, or just a few interviews to do then? Yeah, a few interviews. Okay, sweet. Well, I won't keep you waiting. I think uh, the most significant thing to point out is, I was looking at your, I was actually rewatching it the other day, your last fight against Keith Berry, and if I'm honest, I thought it was a questionable decision. I think it was a clear 10-8 in round one for you, Round two was close. I think it was dominated by you, but apart from the last thirty seconds, say, and then the third round was probably in favor of him. Have you have you rewatched the fight? And did you see it this way at all? And what were your thoughts on the decision? I, I have I have watched the fight, and you know one thing one thing that that I feel that uh, people fail to realize is. There should there, there should be some recognition and maybe even penalization for the referee having to stand up a fight. So you know sometimes uh, the referee feels like there there's not enough action going on because he's pressured by the audience or he's pressured by whatever's going on that, that makes him stand up a fight. So I felt in that second round, I started off, I got the takedown. It took me it took me a minute to gather myself, and then I started landing some elbows, and I felt like he stood me up too soon. So we're in a situation where both of us are, are professional fighters, but he needed an outside assistance to even get back up in the second round and do anything. Had the referee not helped him, he would have stayed on his back for the for the whole second round yeah. and it would have been a, a clear vic- a clear victory so sometimes it's like okay it's like we're it's like if we're in grade school and we're fighting and your friend sees you're losing and comes in and helps you stand up mm-hmm. you know what I mean so you know it's okay it's, I mean we're always going to get criticism because there are so many things out of our control but anytime you need assistance in a fight from an outside influence it, it, it you know it should be looked down upon, and I think that that's that's one of the things that that people people forget because it's not about it's not about we're, we're saying we're looking at an athlete who clearly didn't have the skill to get up off of his back, but for entertainment value, for production value, we have to help him and stand up the fight so there's more action. So the crowd doesn't get displeased. You see what I'm saying? No, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it, yeah, it gets away from from reality, and it goes into the production of the show. You know, so in, in a way, I fall I fall a victim because the, the the crowd doesn't appreciate that part of the game. That hey, this guy on top has such a control level that that he can't even. It, it, this guy can't get up, and he's a trained fighter. You know, we look at we look at Tyrone Woodley's last fight against Damian Maya. Damian Maya and Tyrone Woodley stuffs seventeen takedown attempts, and all of a sudden, he's not doing his job. He's not doing a great job. But we're we're, we're getting away from the fact that he just stuffed seventeen attempts from a high level opponent but once again we're talking about the production value and the entertainment and what the crowd you know what pleases the crowd and that kind of gets away from reality you know so you know sometimes as fighters we fall fall victim to the perception or or, or basically the bloodlust of the uh the the crowd ultimately yeah i understand because victim's a good word there because if i'm honest I can, it's hard because with a referee, they can't position themselves with the fighters, like, you don't just get to the ground and suddenly get top position and landing strikes, like you say, you have to get comfortable, and then once you did get comfortable, you were landing strikes, you were controlling, and then the stand-up comes up, and that last 30 seconds maybe sways the judge's opinions, and there, it's not, you've cost, it's not that you've cost yourself the fight, it's the referee's decision has cost yourself the fight, do you know what I mean? 
and we and we also we also have to look at the fact that I I exerted so much energy in the first round trying to finish the fight. I had two knockdowns. I did a lot of damage against the cage, and you know, hats off to Keith because he was a tough opponent. But I did all the I, I exerted myself. So of course, in the in the next round, I'm I'm only human. I'm gonna have to you know lay back a little bit and then rebuild myself back up. So it's almost like I shouldn't have done so much in the first round and spread it out a little bit more. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. But all this, all this had nothing to do with Keith Berry's skill set. It had to do with someone else assisting him. No one helped, helped me in that fight. I had no help at any point in time, regardless of what situation I was in. But... I still never had my back on the floor. I still never had my back on the cage, and I still didn't get knocked down two times. Yeah, it's a tr- it's a really tricky situation, and if I'm honest, let's hope it doesn't affect any of your future fights. Which brings me on to my next question: was, I mean, your last five fights have been must have been really frustrating. With it's not the usual; it's two draws, two losses, and obviously the really unfortunate thirteen second eye poke. So I'm just wondering, how eager are you to get a win finally at Bellator 182? Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very hungry. You know, very, very hungry, and I, I'm, I'm still motivated. And you know, both of the both of the draws that that, that I got, I, I felt like those were victories. You know, my especially with with my corners, my corners are very conservative about telling me when when I win rounds. We're I mean, we're very, very conservative in both of those fights in the second round, in, in, in the uh, in the beginning of the third round, they were telling me, we won the first two. We won the first two. You know, stay focused. And, you know, so, it, it, you know, even, you know, with, with, with my corners, we all felt that in both of those fights that, uh, you know, I was winning. So, I mean, sometimes it just, uh, it may be the perspective of, 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 of the, the judges, you know, the, I, I think the scorecard on, on the, the 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 fights were a little funny as well. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I have to go out there and I have to play within the rules and 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 win these fights. I think it's similar to like some someone like Mayweather who receives criticism for not for not going out there and and and, and fighting as much as people would want to see a fight. He's defensive. He's smart, and he wins. And I think that I I have to, and what I have done is elevate my fight IQ. I have to go out there and, and, and not just react and be reactive. I have to go out there and outsmart the game because I feel that I've been a victim of the game and outside influence, different different rules, different score systems that are implemented, you know, right before I fight and, and things of that nature. So I've definitely uh, elevated my fight IQ. Yeah, I see what you mean about it's almost you have to fight smarter, not harder, but the fans don't see it that way, which is unfortunate, but I mean, what can you do? And a good thing, a thing you mentioned earlier was about Tyron Woodley, which was interesting because I was going to ask you, because obviously you spoke about how putting a lot of effort into the first round and then the judges don't see that you were pushing for the finish, but a lot of the time, and Woodley gets his criticism a lot, I'm sure you must have heard this a few times, People with a lot of muscle mass, like yourself, the label that always come to it is, oh, he will fade in the later rounds. I mean, what do you have to say to these people when they say these lot? They say they say this stuff. It's, it's, I have nothing to say to them. I all I have to do is go out there and show. You know, I've, I've made adjustments because I would have to definitely agree with them in that department. I have faded in fights. And I've trained hard. I've trained hard, very, very hard. And you always feel like you're prepared. And you don't actually know until you go out there and perform whether or not you had the right system. So I've made adjustments in this camp that have focused primarily on my cardio and my conditioning. That's been the focus for this fight. So once that's out of the equation, then they're going to see a completely different fighter. They're going to see the same fighter in the first round, in the third round. Yeah, I see. So, obviously you just spoke about focusing on your conditioning. I was wondering how much research goes into your opponents during a training camp? 
because obviously your opponent Honeycutt he used to fight at welterweight he's obviously a very good wrestler a two-time all-american i believe i mean obviously his attributes do influence your preparation but is it mostly about being the best kevin casey possible i've definitely done a lot more wrestling this camp than than normal and and we really we really focused on the wrestling and it's not it's not you know the worlds the worlds of jujitsu and wrestling aren't so far apart. You know, as far as jujitsu, I've been a a, a, a Pan American champion, a, a two time national champion, a second and third place in world championships. So I'm I'm on the level in the jujitsu, and I put in my time with the wrestling, working with Kenny Johnson over at Black House. And although I've never competed in a wrestling tournament, a pure wrestling tournament. I feel very comfortable that I have the skill set and the athleticism to compete with someone on his level. Yeah. So you spoke about your training, and I was just curious, um, where have you spent the majority of your camp? Has it been at the body shop or the black house? Because I've seen on your social media, you've been with the likes of Crone and Hiram Gracie, and also Turgy, Tony Ferguson. So how's that training been? I've, I've mainly worked uh, all the, uh, a lot of my training at black house. You know, I, I went down, you know, my my my, uh, my normal striking coach, Anthony Hardong, won't be able to make the, the flight out to New York. So I reached out to Antonio McKee because I, I know that AJ is going to be on the card. And uh, he's, he's been helping me with, with some of my striking. So he's going to be in the back and be able to warm me up. And, and also, you know, those those guys have a tough camp that they run over there. So it was good to, to get in there and see how they're doing things and get some get some feedback, some advice, and share some knowledge, and, and just mix it up in general. You know, I, I trained with uh, with Hit on Gracie for this for this training camp. I trained some with Cone Gracie, and and my foundation of, of the jujitsu is number one. But overall, I feel like that my 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 body and, and my skills have gelled at this point. When I when my I think I was uh, when I saw Sam Alvey. Eight, eight weeks or nine weeks before that fight, I just started with Anthony Hardonk at Dynamics, and I, I learned a completely new system in the Dutch kickboxing style, so I was going out there not really comfortable in the system. You know, before I had a, a, a very boxing-oriented striking style, which, you know, I had some success, you know, I knocked a couple guys out, and I felt, felt good with it, but I, I abandoned it, and I was trying a new style, so I was doing all that with no, you know, no safety net, and now I feel like I've gelled with the system, and my my striking is fluid with my wrestling, and my wrestling is fluid with my jujitsu, and my conditioning is peak. So uh, I've said it before, but you're gonna see the best Kevin Casey August 25th, guaranteed. Yeah, that's good. So um, you spoke about your fight with Sam Alvey. It's been ten months or approaching a year now since you were released by the UFC, and I'd just like to know, Kevin. What effect has this not only had on your fighting career, but your personal life as well? You know what? I, I honestly feel that the UFC gave me more than enough opportunities to, to, to prove myself. So I couldn't be disappointed when they when they released me. But I felt I felt a certain a certain relief in a sense because I was, you know, once once USADA got got implemented, I wasn't able to use IVs to, to rehydrate, you know. And, and throughout my career, I've had issues with my kidneys, and I've had issues with uh, the weight cut. So that was something that was that was huge for me. And I applied for two two IV exemptions with uh, with um, USADA, and, and I was denied twice. And so, you know, I was going out there, and, and I always had this, this this fear in the back of my mind of, of that my body wasn't going to be able to perform. My body wasn't going to feel good. And I, I felt that in my performances. I felt like that, you know, my, my after the first, second, mid-second round, I started to, to go down a little bit. So, you know, being able to, to, to go over here at, at Bellator and not have that, that situation where I'm free to you know, rehydrate my body in the, in the best, most efficient way and to not have that, that, that doubt in the back of my mind of is my body going to hold up 
it, it feels good. Yeah, you know, and to, to be able to be in a position. Yeah, man, I applied for two IV exemptions. When I mm. was on the Ultimate Fighter show, I asked I asked the producers of the show could I get an IV to rehydrate. At that point, I fought three fights in four weeks. So that's three separate that's three separate weight cuts in four weeks where I was denied an IV. And by the time I got to my third fight, I ended up being hospitalized due to uh, acute renal failure mm. from dehydrating myself. So I'm very aware of, of what my body needs to be at, at peak performance, and I was I was basically being denied that. Yeah, you know. So I felt I felt a big a big weight lifted off my shoulder when I said, "Hey, now you know now I can go get an IV. Hey, that's great. Now I can you know get a sponsor." You know, so you know. Ultimately, I, I feel that uh, for whatever reason, that uh, you know, I'm a spiritual guy, and I feel that, that that God wants me where I'm at with Bellator. I feel that Scott Coker treats me good. I feel that he, he I feel a genuine. Uh, I feel like he genuinely he cares for the athletes, and uh, I'm happy where I'm at. That's good. So, this is my last question, Kevin. Obviously, you're the underdog in this fight against Honeycutt. It's something that you must have got used to in your career. Whether you pay attention to it, who knows, but it's especially in your last few fights. Do you like being the underdog? Do you like people counting you out? Or do you just push the stuff off to a side? Yeah, I can't say that I like it. I, I just I'm just used I'm used to it. I'm used to it in my life. I'm I'm used to it uh just in in the way that I've I've grown up. You know, I'm, I'm used to being that, that person who has to persevere, who has to prove, prove himself, who has to work twice as hard as everyone else. So it, it, it's nothing for me to, to go out there and, uh, and be that underdog because it makes the victory that much sweeter. Kevin, thank you very much for such an insightful and honest talk. And all the best come August 26th, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Have a good day, mate. Kevin, next up is Lucas Grandshire with BJ Penn.